lieu of them waiving health benefits. And we currently do um, provide a small $5,000 stipend to employees if they waive their benefits under certain criteria. And to my knowledge, that's nothing that we have talked about further either at personnel or certainly not at finance. Maybe it's something that we want to open up the dialogue for. Um, maybe it's, you know, personnel would take it on first before, before finance would take a look at it. And the last question that we, um, again, this is one that has been on here a couple of years, and it talks about the workman's compensation that, <clears throat> excuse me, an employee is entitled to 70% of their weekly wages, both in the borough and in the former township. We um, pay 100% of the base salary for workman's comp. So if someone's injured on the job, we are not cutting their pay back to 70%. We're keeping them at 100%, but we're getting reimbursed from our joint insurance fund for 70% of that amount. And generally, I mean, we turn people around and they're usually back to work pretty quickly, um, you know, for workman's comp. So there are the five questions out of the 50 that we were not able to answer yes to. Um, like I mentioned, we're still going to keep our state aid. We're not having any kind of reduction in there. So I can answer any questions if you had specifics about others. Otherwise, um, we just have to make a note in the minutes that we've discussed this publicly. And uh, that's it. Ms. Cremont, I just have a quick question. Why are some of them red and... <laughs> Bob actually asked this when we when we sat and went through it. It was it's for the state. Green may mean that some of them are repeat questions. You can only answer them certain ways depending on the color. So they had a whole chart of what the colors meant. On the last sheet, it tells you what they each means. Yeah. Oh, there it is. You're right. Um, but I would recommend to personnel committee that we take up the number thirty nine and looking at the um, health benefits. Just, okay. just in order to say that we've looked at it at the very least. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I was also supposed to, although Scott kind of stole my thunder on this one. Um, Kathy and I, a couple of weeks ago, talked with the rating agencies again because we were going to have the bond sale, and both of them reaffirmed the AAA rating, so we were thrilled with that. Um, but we did have the bond sale last week. Um, we sold $9.9 .9 million with a net interest of 1.83%. So we were thrilled with that being under 2%. And, you know, it says a lot about the AAA rating and, and where we're going. Great. That's good news. Thank you. Okay. I know there's um, there are a lot of people here for the Poe Road um, uh, public hearing. So with Council's um, consent, we'll, we'll move that item up. The um, bond ordinance by the municipality of Princeton authorizing as a local improvement, the construction of sidewalks along Poe Road, appropriating the sum of $38,500, therefore providing for the financing of said appropriation by the making of a down payment and issuance of bonds or notes of said municipality and further providing for the special assessment of 50% of the cost thereof. And um, how we'll work this is we're going to start with a presentation from staff, then um, if there's questions from council, we'll go to that, and then I'll open up the public hearing um, for anybody um, who's here who'd like to speak on this issue. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Kaiser, engineer. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Back in the summer, uh, New Jersey American Water Company came to the municipality and said that they needed to replace the water mains on Random Road and also on Poe Road. And uh, uh, we had discussions with them, and they, they agreed to mill and resurface each of those roads after the water lines would be installed. Uh, in the case of Random Road, that water main has been installed and that road has been milled and resurfaced. In the case of Poe Road, which is a distance of just over 500 feet, uh, running from Princeton Kingston Road to Random Road, we've had them hold up on that uh, because we thought there may be some benefit to consider curbing and installing sidewalk along that road prior to New Jersey American Water Company installing the paving. Typically, we like to, the, the paving would last 20 to 25 years, so we thought now's the time to really take a look at this section of road to see if uh, uh, sidewalks and curbing should be installed. 
we have some slide, quick slides to show just to familiarize you uh, with the road that will run through very quickly. And then Deanna will uh, uh, review the complete streets and the master plan provisions. And then Sergeant Murray will speak to the traffic safety uh, uh, issues uh, relating to, the, to this particular section of road. As you can see here on the screen, uh, this is Poe Road at Random Road, uh, uh, shooting toward Princeton Kingston Road. As you can see on the right and the left, there's currently a sidewalk on both sides of the road that runs all the way to Shady Brook, a distance of just over 1,200 feet. So what's being proposed is to uh, complete this road when it's being paved, install sidewalks on either side so those sidewalks could extend to Princeton Kingston Road, which is labeled here as Route 27. This shows a, a detail as a conceptual uh, plan as to what can be done. There's a 70-foot wide right-of-way. Uh, the existing road varies in width from a uh, distance of 19 feet to 28 feet. And conceptually, what we propose here is a uniform 26-foot wide uh, width with grass strips on either side. But that's subject to uh, uh, change. Sometimes we install the curb. Uh, install the sidewalk uh, uh, up tight to the curb, and sometimes we provide a grass strip, but those details haven't been worked out yet. This shows uh, Poe Road, uh, and the camera is actually uh, shooting toward Prospect uh, uh, Avenue Extension. As you can see, there's no sidewalks on Prospect Avenue Extension, but as we'll see later on, the master plan calls for sidewalks here on this section of Poe Road on Prospect Avenue Extension, as well as along Princeton-Kingston Road. Uh, here's uh, Princeton-Kingston Road uh, shooting uh, at, at, at Poe Road. And again, Poe Road is on the left. Uh, Prospect Avenue Extension is on the right. And straight ahead is a pathway that we had DOT install from Prospect Avenue Extension across the Harry's Brook Bridge uh, to the Lake Carnegie parking lot and recreation area. And here's a better shot of that particular pathway. This shows the uh, Princeton Community Master Plan. And shown showing in red are uh, 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 in solid are existing sidewalks and in dashed proposed sidewalks. And as you can see, uh, the, the circle, uh, the upper right, uh, shows the area of the proposed project, which is a 500-foot section of Pearl Road. And it indicates that there are existing sidewalks uh, going to the north all the way to the Shady Brook Lane, and also additional walkways on Tyson Lane and Little Brook Road leading all the way to the Little Brook School. Uh, what's proposed here is, again, that 500-foot section. And then, in addition, what's shown here is future uh, walkway along Princeton-Kingston Road and also along Prospect Avenue, which would pick up at the existing uh, sidewalk near uh, Carnegie Drive and then extend to Prospect so neighbors in the Riverside area could uh, get across uh, Princeton Kingston Road to the Littlebrook area. Deanna, at this point, will uh, speak regarding the master plan and the uh, uh, complete streets elements. Whenever a project is proposed either by a utility or by engineering through the capital improvement program, we always look to the master plan to see if there are proposed improvements that are required to complete our sidewalk network, our bike path network. Um, and what I've provided here is an excerpt of the circulation element that was recently adopted last year that does indicate whenever there is um, sidewalks within a half a mile of a public or private school, we should give priority to the completing those pathways. Uh, so when New Jersey American Water Company came to us with their project on Random and Poe, we, we took the master plan off the shelf, took a look at it, and found that we did have indeed that missing section of sidewalk 
on Poe Road that could be completed at the same time um, the road is resurfaced by the uh, utility. In addition to that, last year the complete streets policy was put into effect by the uh, council and planning board, which basically says you need to look at every road and look at how you can accommodate all users on those roads. Can you accommodate transit, pedestrians, bicyclists, as well as vehicles? Uh, as Bob showed on the previous slide, we do have transit stops on Princeton Kingston Road at Poe. Um, so if we provide this section of sidewalk, this 500 foot section of sidewalk, we would then provide a safe connection to transit. Um, also, we pay for hazardous busing every year for students that live on Princeton Kingston Road that travel to Littlebrook. We've got uh, approximately seven households right now in that area that we bus. Um, so if we can include this section of pathway on Poe Road, I've already started a dialogue with our Historic Preservation Commission to continue pathway on Princeton Kingston Road. It is a state and federal um, historic district and so there will be design standards required and we'll have to go through state authorization. But we have started that dialogue to see exactly what's involved because uh, we would like to make our community more walkable for, for all people. You know, your seniors as well as your school age children and, and it helps get people to transit and out of vehicles. Um, when we completed the Roper Road improvements, I think just about two years ago, we successfully uh, added in a piece of sidewalk on Roper Road that then allowed for crossing uh, to another transit stop on Princeton Kingston Road and that's just shown in this picture here. Uh, currently um, at Riverside uh, Drive uh, West there's a crosswalk and then as you travel east on Princeton Kingston Road the next crosswalk is here at Roper Road and then if the sidewalks are installed on Poe, there'll be a crosswalk installed at Poe as well to allow for movement between the uh, two neighborhoods. Uh, the sidewalks as proposed are recommended by the Traffic and Transportation Committee and the uh, Traffic and, and uh, the Traffic Safety Committee and the Traffic and Transportation Committee. And Sergeant Murray is here, our traffic safety officer, to speak regarding uh, traffic safety matters relating to proposed sidewalks. Sergeant Murray. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Sergeant Tom Murray, the current traffic safety officer for the uh, Princeton Police Department. Uh, first, I'd like to say that uh, I feel that Bob and Deanna did an excellent job um, within the recent emails that have been going on about answering the questions about the, the importance of this. Um, I think the information that was provided was extremely accurate. Um, the reason I say that uh, is I may, you may hear me reiterating some of the importance of the same, um, but I really feel I don't, it can't be explained any clearer than they already have explained it to everyone on the council via those emails. Uh, that being said, one of my primary responsibilities as a traffic officer uh, for this police department is to constantly promote and ensure the safety of everyone uh, within the community, whether it be a motorist, a bicyclist, or a pedestrian. Um, so that being said, whenever I have the opportunity to make any recommendations for improvements in that area, I do my best to help push the same. Um, I have a long history with Bob Kaiser and his staff um, in working towards establishing what we heard earlier, the sidewalk master plan, which you can see up on the screen in front of you. Um, that sidewalk master plan has been in the making since the early 80s. So we're talking about 30 years worth of work to try to put this piece of puzzle together to develop um, an effective and consistent sidewalk system, especially surrounding our elementary uh, middle schools and the high school. Um, to stop now um, would be a great disservice, I feel, to the community. We have um, I should say during my tenure, this is my third go around as traffic safety officer, uh, we've never had one of these requests voted down. 
um, and the results are obvious. You can see it up there. We've done nothing but constantly chip away at it and make things safer. Uh, in addition, there has never been during my tenure in August or September where my telephone hasn't rung in my office from a concerned parent from a, sky, uh, from a, a child that's attending the Princeton public school system um, asking for sidewalks or asking in their particular case uh, to be, have their child qualified for a hazardous routes bus uh, program or route because a gap exists in the sidewalk system. One of the toughest things of my job uh, is to try to work those system or work those predicaments out because uh, we, we all know that the hazardous routes busing is extremely expensive. Uh, they're hesitant to uh, add any more routes to the existing routes because of the cost and the cost they're eventually transferred to the taxpayers. So I'm constantly challenged with trying to find a way to get those children safely to school. We have had those concerns expressed on Snowden Lane, Overbrook, and Roper Road within the past 10 years. The reason that I use those three examples are that we now have sidewalks on Snowden, Roper, and Overbrook. They were all on the master plan. We pushed for them to get done. There was a great deal of opposition to all of those um, sidewalk implementations. However, for the common good of all, we pushed it through and um, they were implemented, and I feel the benefits are obvious uh, to everyone in the community. Basically, when a sidewalk doesn't exist, it comes down to asking a pedestrian to expose themselves to potential conflict, because there is no other option. We're asking them to walk within the roadway. If we do, however, provide them a safe route via the implementation of a sidewalk, we do create some separation and therefore a safer, a safer route uh, for anybody that would wish to use that. Um, I'm sure that after I speak tonight, we're going to hear numerous concerns from residents as to why the sidewalk should not be implemented on Poe Road. I've been through this process numerous times before. Uh, I would bet my next paycheck on that I've heard every, every uh, concern there is. That is not to belittle those concerns. Um, I respect all of the concerns. I know that um, some are legitimate. However, I know that the benefits of putting in the, the, um, the sidewalk will far outweigh some of those concerns. In short, um, I guess what it really comes down to is that their concerns or the concerns that you're going to hear tonight are unlike or not unlike the other concerns that have been expressed in former years. And the people that have expressed those concerns that have ended up with the sidewalks in their neighborhood have had to bear the, uh, the burden, so to speak, as far as finances and the maintenance concerns, but yet the community has benefited as a whole. So I'm asking everyone in the council to keep that in mind. In conclusion, um, tonight I know that we're talking about Poe Road specifically, but may suggest that this really is about Princeton as a whole. Uh, in November of 2013, the council voted on adopting what was called the Complete Streets Program, and that is to go in and assess an area and fairly and objectively provide uh, safe routes for all concerned parties, meaning motorists, pedicyclists or bicyclists and pedestrians. This right now is a perfect example of how we can go about and continue on with that uh, policy and implementing the same. Um, in short, Poe Road needs a sidewalk for the good of the community. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions you may have. Are there any questions from council to staff at this point? Ms. Butler? Um, Deanna, the county has also adopted uh, complete streets, did they not, and the state? Yes, the state has adopted it, and I think the I county, think the has, county has, as well. has too. Um, in terms of um, the King's Highway, when do you have any sense of when we might be looking at um, sidewalk on that stretch? Part of if I could interject, uh, we've been notified by DOT that they plan on milling and resurfacing. 
uh, portion of Princeton Kingston Road, actually in this this particular area, this this next year. Uh, we're not aware of resurfacing also including sidewalks, but we certainly could uh, speak to DOT and, and, and lobby DOT to, if they don't install sidewalks, to authorize the town to install those sidewalks. Um, Bob or Dan, I'm not sure. Um, what would be the um, ramification or what would be the impact if we don't accept the... Um, the sidewalks for Pill Road. I know I mentioned, I heard I'm, I'm Officer Murray, Sergeant Murray, but is there a financial impact due to the works being done now or? Well, as I said earlier, the, the paving is being done at no cost to the municipality by New Jersey American uh, Water Company. So let's say we said, okay, uh, we won't install sidewalks now. We won't install the curbing now. We would just authorize uh, New Jersey American to go ahead and do the paving. But when and if we decide to install the sidewalks, we will also need the curb. And uh, when we do that, the best practice is, is, would also be to resurface the road as opposed to having a road that's patched uh, with the curb and sidewalk installed after the fact. So the, it will be the cost of the resurfacing, uh, which we estimate around $75 a foot. Uh, so we're talking about uh, $37,000, $38,000 in cost uh, uh, for the paving. And I might add, once again, just to reiterate, um, potential, potentially maintained uh, hazardous routes, bossing routes, and potential for increased routes as well. All it takes is for one family to move into the area, and we can't deem the walk route safe to school, then we have to uh, provide busing for them. Okay, thank you. I know there's a lot of um, public that want to speak too. So if, are there any further questions or comments? Uh, yeah, yes, the, the question I had, uh, Sergeant Mary, I may have misunderstood you. Did you say you authored the sidewalk plan or helped author it? Or did I misunderstand? Um, did you say you authored the the, the the sidewalk plan, that part of the master plan, or did I misunderstand you when you were speaking? Because I, I had a, my, my understanding was that the the, the planning board authors the no, I plan. didn't. Sure, sure. sure. And, and and I can respond to that. The the planning board uh, authored the uh, sidewalk and the bike path master plan, and that was in place uh, really in the early early 80s, and it's tweaked somewhat over the years, but. The bulk of that plan is the plan that was put together in the early 80s by the planning board. And, and has it been the consistent practice of the uh, prior governments, prior to consolidation, to, as um, uh, resurfacing occurs, to actually build sidewalks in cons consistently with the master plan every time, or is it skipped sometimes? And if so, are there certain decisions that are made along the way? If there's a road improvement project, we bring to the municipality uh, uh, the matter for consideration. And if the walkways are shown in the master plan every time in the past, the, at least in the former, former township that I was a part of, the sidewalks uh, have been installed. That's all I have at this point. Okay. Um, okay, well, I'd like to um, open up the public hearing. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, so if you'd like to speak, um, you can just come line up behind the microphone and if you can please state your name and uh, make sure you're speaking directly into the microphone and that way your comments will be captured in the minutes. And if you've written comments that you'd like us to include as part of the minutes verbatim, you can um, hand them to Ms. McDermott when you're done, the clerk. Thank you, Mayor. And, oh, yeah, and if you could also, just because I know there's a lot of people who want to speak, if you can um, try to limit your comments to three minutes, um, and if somebody else has said something you agree with, you can no just problem. mention that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Norm Glickman. Um, I have been, I'm an economist, and I've been teaching urban public policy for nearly 50 years uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Texas at Austin, and more, most recently at the Blaustein School at Rutgers. Uh, I live at 37 Poe Road, which is about five houses in from um, Route 27. One of the areas that I've studied is public investment and infrastructure. 
There are many ways that building and improving roads can help communities. I've just finished a book on the legacies of Lyndon Johnson, who made major investments in infrastructure, and most of the time got them right. Um, the, sidewalk, uh, the sidewalk installation indeed helps residents and neighborhoods when and only when there are a lot of pedestrians. This is important to keep in mind. Uh, the, the, the rationale is that the benefit of building a sidewalk for the public should outweigh the costs monetarily and in future maintenance uh, borne by a few individuals. So it's important, two, two points there. One is that um, the, the costs need to uh, be borne, should not be borne by a few individuals. Um, in thinking about the proposal, proposed sidewalks on Poe Road, I tried to find ways that these so-called improvements could help the neighborhood and the town of Princeton. There's very little vehicular traffic on Pearl Road. This Pearl Road essentially only runs one long block from the state highway to Shady Brook. I would refer to Shady Brook as nowhere. Not, not very little reason to take that take Pearl Road uh, from the highway to um, Shady Brook. We understand that the goal of protecting the, the safety of the walking public, there's only a tiny amount of foot traffic on Poe Road. We don't see kids walking on this segment of Poe, nor do we see the elderly walking along the street. Um, uh, hardly anyone walks down the street at all. I sat on my front stoop uh, this afternoon just to sort of check it out. Um, and uh, in nearly two hours, I felt like the Maytag repairman. I was really lonely. Uh, we don't even attract trick-and-treaters on, on Halloween. Um, there's nobody that comes around. Um, the sidewalk project will cost a lot of money and obligate homeowners, homeowners most of whom are se who are seniors, not only to pay for the improvement, but also remove snow uh, from the sidewalks after storm or face citations from the township. Is this last cost that seems particularly misguided and unfair, we have so few people who will benefit from the sidewalk. I have trouble finding, identifying people who would benefit from this sidewalk. Uh, let me say that when people are assured that the usefulness of the project outweighs the costs in dollars and future obligations for senior homeowners, I would support it and pay my fair share. But I think there are better ways to invest our resources than this. This program is inequitable, puts pressure on relatively few people, and mainly elderly people. There are other ways to do these things, and we should try to find them. Thank you. Dan Rappaport. I fully agree with all the points that Sergeant Murray made. Um, the reason that sidewalks are built is to increase public safety. And I don't know anything about the accident history. And I don't really think it's important for me to know about the accident history. But the goal is to see that there are never any accidents and so I realize that it's an expense to Mr. Glickman and the other homeowners there, but there really are no negative externalities. There are only positive externalities associated with constructing a sidewalk. And we adopted a complete streets policy, and I don't want us to be hypocrites and say a complete street policy is valid in one place and not someplace else. The word complete means finish in the entirety, the whole, everything. Let no space for completing sidewalks be left behind. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Jillian Reeder. I live at 139 Random Road, which uh, was nicely displayed. It's on the corner of Poe and Random. Random has no sidewalks. Uh, I think I probably represent the shifting demographic of the neighborhood. Two young children, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. We're pretty active in the neighborhood. We walk, we scoot, we ride. We walk my daughter to Little Brook School every day. We never go up Poe Road. Not because there aren't sidewalks, but because it doesn't go anywhere for us. There's nothing to do. And even with, this, with the sidewalk on Princeton Kingston, we wouldn't, we wouldn't go in that direction. I think that there are um, many other streets that should be prioritized over this section of Poe Road. I would say streets near, near playgrounds, like TR. Um, streets near schools, which I think it was mentioned, in fact, uh, Little Brook North, near uh, Little Brook Elementary. Um, and then Snowden Road, I know that was also mentioned, but there, there are actually great swaths of Snowden that um, are not uh, with sidewalks and are pretty dangerous. And I speak from experience because I've run on those streets, I've wheeled my children in their buggies on those streets and we walk five mornings a week um, on those streets. And I would also say, you know, on random, perhaps I misunderstood, on random we don't have sidewalks, but a bus was not offered to our family for getting to school safely. So I, perhaps I don't understand exactly how that works, but um, I would say the bottom line for us is that Putting a sidewalk on Poe Road is not a priority for, for my family or for Princeton. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Christine Casati, and I live at 12 Poe Road. I actually have two addresses, 806 Princeton Kingston Road and 12 Poe Road, where they deliver my mail, where the driveway is. So I actually have um, maybe 50 percent, 25 percent of the land along which the sidewalk would run. And if they add the Princeton Kingston portion of it, um, more like 50 percent. So I'm 64 years old. I'm planning to retire soon. And uh, we don't have any young children. My oldest is, uh, youngest is 22. And I'm concerned. Uh, I bought the house because it was in a rural environment without sidewalks. And I'm looking forward to my retirement there, but I don't want to spend it shoveling snow or paying for it. Um, as far as the safety issue is concerned, um, I don't know of any accidents to pedestrians in that area. Very, very few people walk along there. Sometimes they're athletes that jog there from the university. Uh, and that's pretty much uh, all that we see in terms of uh, um, people. Um, I would like to also question the statements that were made about the benefit to the neighborhood because um, Littlebrook School is eight tenths of a mile from there. It's only it's five tenths of a mile. It's half a mile to Littlebrook Road. Mr. Kaiser, but from Littlebrook Road to Littlebrook School is almost another half a mile. No children, and I've never seen any families or children attempt to cross prospect. Any family living across Route 27 uh, goes to Riverside School. They're districted in the Riverside School District. So what point would there be to have a crosswalk there except for athletes from the university who jog. Um, I really don't understand the complete street concept. I've never seen the complete street report, nor justification that it actually serves all the needs of the homeowners in Princeton, because our situations are different. And uh, I would like to see that report. There is no plan to put any sidewalk along Random Road, along which there are multi-million dollar homes and many, many families that go to Little 
to work school? And why aren't there sidewalks being planned along there if Poe Road is so important? No family along Princeton Kingston Road facing the lake will allow their young children, I've talked to them, to walk along Princeton Kingston Road to get to Poe for a bus stop? They already have a bus stop on Shady Brook. Um, it would be far too dangerous for an elementary school to walk there. So it's in an area where there really is no virtual human traffic, except very little of it. So um, I also am wondering why you would spend taxpayer money to put sidewalks there, even if you think you're getting a deal from the water department, um, when they're really not warranted or needed or requested by any citizen except the engineering department, as far as I know. I, don't, I would like to know if there has been any request by any citizen in the re or residing in Princeton. And this money is from taxpayers, not just an assessment against us, but uh, taxpayer money from all of you, from all of those of you who reside in Princeton. And have they been informed of this? You know, regardless of the cost, it's spending money that isn't necessary. I have a statement, and your names are each on it. I would like to provide a copy to all of the council members and Madam Mayor, if you don't mind. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Yes, good evening. My name is Bob DiMartino, and I live at 820 Princeton Kingston Road. And my wife, I am retired, and my wife Ellen and I w w are being charged almost $4,200 for a project that nobody on Poe wants or needs. I regret that my wife could not be at the September 22nd council meeting when the sidewalk ordinance was introduced. My wife had colon cancer surgery that day. Ellen regrets that she cannot be here tonight to voice her uh, opinion against this ordinance because today she began her chemotherapy. But the issue is so important to us, and we've lived there for 21 years, that she asked me to come here and to speak for both of us tonight. I have here a petition that all fam seven families involved in the project have signed opposing the proposed Poe project. That's 100%. And I know that all of you involved in political life sometimes find it pretty hard to get 100% of anyone to be behind anything. But anyway, the threat from the proposal has caused my wife, Ellen, and me a considerable amount of anguish. We do not want to be forced to consider moving from our home in which we plan to retire because of what we feel is an ill-conceived project that would not have been, <coughs> that should not have been recommended to the Princeton Council. The project is not cost effective, first of all. The proposed pro project, <coughs> pro, pro roads, my wife's a better, far better speaker than me. But I'm afraid you're stuck with me tonight. But anyway, um, the Poe Road, uh, Poe Road existing sidewalk grid is off the uh, Princeton existing sidewalk grid. And unless sidewalks are first built on Princeton Kingston, as Mr. Kaiser said, they are not there and they are not on prospect, they really would connect with nothing as part of the Princeton sidewalk grid at this point. Um, in addition, um, one of the uh, goals of this project was to have Little Brook skill Little Brook school children walk along Route 27, which during peak traffic hours, traffic routinely exceeds the 45 mile an hour speed limit. I think that this is a dangerous thing to propose. Again, of the seven families that are, would be forced to pay 50% of the cost of these unnecessary sidewalks, Five are made up of senior citizens and retired and physically challenged persons. The financial and physical challenges of the sidewalk would place upon these residents would be true hardships. My wife and I, as several of the other senior residents of Poe, have serious health issues, such as cancer and heart conditions. We simply could not shovel 
the, the snow and ice off hundreds of feet of unnecessary sidewalk. It simply is not fair to charge senior residents who are already financially struggling to pay 50% of a project that would not even be on their property, claiming that we are somehow the benefited property on, owner only adds insult to injury. When I first learned about the proposed Pro project in the summer, I did try several times to discuss this with Mr. Kaiser and Ms. Stockton, and I emailed and phoned the engineering office. I understand that quite a bit of work has been done by the engineering office and by um, Sergeant Murray for this project, but I've never spoken with any of them on this project. However, uh, when I never heard back from my request to meet with them, I went to the engineering office personally on August 1. This was before the August 4th meeting where the project was announced. I was told by the receptionist, I believe her name is Lauren, who checked with um, Ms. Stockton and, and Mr. Kaiser, that they were too busy to speak with me. Um, I volunteer, I do teaching in the Princeton Public Library, and I said, well, I have a couple of hours. I'm happy to wait. And she again checked and said they were too busy to speak with me. Even if I came back, they would not have time to speak with me about this project. And again, um, since I'm across from my other neighbor, Christine, our uh, property on Poe would be approximately 50% of one side of Poe for this project. And you would think that perhaps a resident residing for decades on the road that they are considering for a project could have some useful information for them. So I believe the proposed project for new sidewalks on Poe Road would not serve the public interest, would not be cost effective, and would instead trust force true hardships upon the seniors and physically challenged persons currently residing on Poe Road. Senior citizens who have resided and paid taxes as we have for decades in Princeton have earned the right to retire in our own homes and not have to be forced to consider moving due to a wasteful project that has no real benefits, no immediate benefits to the project unless it is connected to the, to the current sidewalk grid. However, for whatever ill-conceived reason this project was developed, it is not engineering or any other department at Princeton that passes this ordinance, but rather you, the Princeton Council, and our mayor. And I know that as a council member, you want to do what's best for Princeton, and I'd ask, for, ask that you vote no on this proposed Pro, uh, Pro Road sidewalk project. I also want to say a couple of personal statements. I do feel somewhat humiliated that senior citizens who offer a great deal to the community have to quantify and justify our value against sidewalks that do not. An ordinance that would cause such hardship to even a small group of Princeton residents would need to offer, in, my, in our opinion, a great deal for the public good. And I don't feel that this proposal simply meets that standard. And I also believe that it would send a terrible message to residents such as seniors and other persons who are living on fixed incomes. And I'd like to thank you very much for considering these comments. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Hi, my name is Anita Jirigay. I live at 43 Wigan Street. Oh, is this better? Is this better? Great. Okay, Anita Jirigay, 43 Wigan Street. And as a member of the Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Committee and an active walker in Princeton, I support the development of sidewalks on Poe Row Road. Uh, streets in Princeton, I think, should be designed to serve all people, whether on foot or bike or in their cars. And infrastructure such as sidewalks really do help make streets safe for all users, are an important way to encourage people to use public transportation, and I think are important for a sustainable future in town. Thank you. Thank you. Good 
Good evening. I'm Sam Bunting. That's B-U-N-T-I-N-G, of 99 Dempsey Avenue in Princeton. I'm also a member of the Pedestrian Bicycling Advisory Committee and the Traffic and Transportation Committee, but I have had no role in the development of the project, the proposal to put sidewalks on Poe Road. In fact, the first I heard about this was when I was reading about it in the newspaper when I learned that some of the residents were opposed to this project. So I, I would like to speak tonight in my own personal capacity as somebody who is a frequent walker, jogger, and a newly uh, stroller pusher around the town of Princeton, that I strongly support this proposal to put sidewalks on Po Road. And the reason I support it is exactly for the reasons that Sergeant Murray said. It's, it's got to be about safety. Safety first. If we look at what happened last week on Washington Road, when a father and his son were out trying to enjoy a beautiful fall day and having done nothing wrong, ended up in hospital with life-altering injuries. I don't think anybody in our community can possibly be happy with that. And when we think about the causes of these so-called accidents, we are always inclined to look for the specific proximate cause in terms of what the driver did or the walker did or the cyclist did, which led to the specific accident in question. Whereas really the problem is a problem of the built environment. The crossing was not safe at that intersection. And I am delighted that the municipality is working with the county authorities to have that intersection fixed because the failure of to put in a safe built environment was, in my opinion, a strong contributor to that accident. Now, with regards to this project and to the other projects that are going on around the town, I think it is entirely appropriate that we are proactive in putting in appropriate safety measures within the built environment that will act to reduce or prevent the possibility of these terrible accidents in the future. I congratulate the prudence and professionalism of our municipal engineering team in putting together these proposals to develop a joined up sidewalk network, sidewalk network around our town. A, a network is only as good as its worst part. So if we have these missing links in the sidewalk network, it degrades the entire network. Therefore, the proposal to put in a sidewalk on Po Road is not just an issue which affects the people on Po Road, it's an issue which affects the entire community in making it possible for people to get around our community safely without a car. I, I want to push back against this idea that nobody is going to use a sidewalk on Po Road and that nobody walks on Po Road. Well, for a start, of course people don't walk on Po Road if there's no sidewalk. It's because it's not safe. If you put a sidewalk in, it will enable people to push their stroller safely, to walk their dogs safely, to go for a jog safely without having to wonder if a car is going to come flying around the corner off Route 27, which we all agree is a very fast moving road, and send them to the hospital. So with that in mind, I think we have to think about safety first. Safety first on Po Road, complete the sidewalk network, complete the streets, and provide safety for all the Princeton residents. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Um, I just want to see if there's any more public comment, and then we're going to close the public hearing. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Yeah, one more quick comment, and then then I'll close the public hearing. Thank you very much. I just wanted to speak. The, uh, the previous speaker just spoke about safety on Pro uh, on Po Road, and again, I've lived on Po Road for uh, over over 21 years, and I walk my dog on Po at least three times a day, and never once, never once have we felt the safe the need for a sidewalk for safety on Po. 
And I just wanted to add that comment to, to my statement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to um, close public comment now and turn it back over to Mr. Kaiser, and then um, we'll take it back up at Council for discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, two comments I'd like to make. Uh, I believe there must have been some sort of miscommunication. I know Ms. Stockton and myself are accessible. If somebody wants to meet with us, we would certainly uh, uh, want, want to meet, so there must be some sort of communication. I just checked my emails. I received a very cordial email from uh, Dr. DiMartino on October 2nd inquiring regarding survey flags, flags on his property. I explained what they were and also advised that the public hearing would be this evening uh, regarding the project. So we're happy to meet with neighbors uh, uh, and, uh, and we sort of pride ourselves in, in, uh, in, in going to people's property and meeting with them. So I just don't want that, that message to get, get out there that we, we shut out residents because we don't. And uh, I, I hope we have the reputation that we work with residents to the extent we can. Um, secondly, uh, regarding the half mile distance, I know Ms. Stockton had checked that, but that's to the rear access to the uh, Little Brook School property, the half mile distance, as opposed to going around to the front. So we'd be happy to share that information as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Liverman? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, you, Pole Road is a, seems like a nice neighborhood. Um, I have used to run down Pole Road myself year, years ago. I haven't been down there in a while. Um, I've been sitting up here about I don't know, 11, 12, how many years Brian and I have been sitting here. And we've gone through sidewalk changes like you wouldn't believe. Um, I remember Overbrook, um, Snowden. Um, I can't tell you how many times this has occurred where uh, the neighbors um, just don't want the sidewalks. And um, the reason, I understand why, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, health problems, shoveling snow, um, a cost, the cost effect, and I definitely understand um, what, what you're saying. Um, and also the perceived notion that it may not be a danger, um, which is also um, something that I do understand. Um, but uh, when I, when I go down Snowden Lane now and I see neighbors that were actually fighting me, uh, basically, um, because I, I actually was a young guy and went and met with them in their home, um, they tell me thank you um, for the sidewalk. Uh, when I go down Overbrook, they tell me thank you for the sidewalk. And over and over again. It sounds daunting, it sounds crazy, but um, a sidewalk isn't as bad as, as you think. Um, there are some areas I, I am extremely concerned. One is if it's a cost-related um, factor um, for, for some neighbors, if there's something that we can do for a cost-related factor, if it's a strain or a budget or going or gonna to have somebody move from Princeton because of a sidewalk, I would hate to see that. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that um, we could be setting a precedent, as Councilman Simon said earlier, if we do these in pieces, if when projects come available or come, be, come before us and we say, no, this isn't good because um, these neighbors, they don't want it, but then we do another project in another area and they say, well, we want the, the sidewalk and we're piecemealing this whole plan. The reason why we're doing Pole Road instead of the other um, roads that were mentioned is because we're doing major infrastructure, major work at this time. And it just makes sense to do all of it at one time. So I do hear um, everything that you said, and I thank you so much for being so cordial. Um, but it just makes it um, uh, very difficult to say no to a project that seems like it should go in that direction. Thank you. Mr. Miller and then Ms. Cromer. I don't have any questions at this point, but I do have a comment. I'd like to say that I intend to vote no on the ordinance authorizing sidewalks between um, on Long Pole Road between Random and Route 27. Although I believe that, that sidewalks will eventually be built on this short stretch of Pole Road, I'm not convinced they cannot be built at a later time when there's more of a demonstrated need. I do support installing a Belgian block curbing now so that the curbing can delineate the street 
and be in place when the need for sidewalks is clear. The proposed sidewalk between Route 27 and Random Road are intended to provide a connector to sidewalks to be built at some future date on the south side of Route 27 and on Prospect Avenue Extension. However, these do not exist at the present time, and the connector sidewalks on Poe Road could be built if and when the sidewalks on Route 27 and the Prospect Avenue Extension are built. I'm also concerned that providing sidewalks between Random and Route 27 would encourage pedestrians to cross Route 27 at a location where the speed limit is 45 miles an hour and there's no pedestrian crossing in order to reach a New Jersey Transit bus stop location, which is really just a sign and not a bus shelter, across from Pro Road on the south side of Route 27. I think that uh, Route 27 at that point, uh, the speed limit is 45 miles an hour, but I think cars regularly exceed 45 miles an hour, probably doing 50 or 55 miles an hour because uh, as you go further north toward Kingston, uh, there is development only on one side of the road. For these reasons, I will vote no on the proposed ordinance. Um, yeah, Ms. Kremler, and then I want to get Sergeant Murray's um, opinion on whether what, what Mr. Miller just said about the danger of uh, maybe encouraging people to cross 27, but um, did you want to yeah. give your first all, does anybody else smell burning plastic or is it just me? <laughs> if nobody else smells it, then I, I probably don't. Okay, nobody else does. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Um, um, people should not have to walk in the street, whether it's children walking to their friends' houses to play or neighborhoods or neighbors taking a walk or for any of the many reasons people walk along streets. Um, this, is, this is about the present and future residents. Um, sidewalk master plan is a good plan for creating the sidewalk system that benefits everyone. It calls for constructing sidewalks when we're doing road projects, which is the most efficient way to build the sidewalks. Um, I'm sorry for the challenge of shoveling, that shoveling is creating for Poe Road neighbors. Um, we're looking into ways to help those who find it difficult to shovel snow and who can't afford to pay someone. Um, mowing lawns is also challenging for many el elderly residents, um, but most people who mow lawns, either their own property or for pay, can also shovel sidewalks. Um, we as a council have to make decisions that are for best for both existing and for future residents. Sidewalks are a public good that we as, have a, as a council have decided to support both through our complete streets policy and through our sidewalk master plan. It's always hard for people who are forced to get new sidewalks. It's tough. You are a well-organized and well-spoken group, but I believe these sidewalks are for the common good. Um, Sergeant Murray, are you would you be um, able to respond to Mr. Miller's concern about um, the worry that if you put in sidewalks, people will be more encouraged to try to cross 27? Yes, uh, Mayor, I'd be more than happy to. Um, first, let me say that um, I believe that Mr. Miller's concerns are legitimate concerns. Uh, there would be concerns that I share as well. However, um, as I tried to make clear earlier, this is a piece of a puzzle, and we have an opportunity to put another piece together. We're currently applying for grant funds for a sidewalk system along Princeton Kingston Road, and should we be successful, we're successful in another way. Uh, these are all things that we could utilize to our advantage to position the state to potentially lower the speed limit on Princeton Kingston Road. Even if we are unsuccessful, uh, some of the measures that we would be able to employ uh, as the result of a sidewalk may even help in the interim. Uh, and what I'm specifically referring to here is that uh, right now you cannot put a crosswalk marking across the roadway unless you have an established, unless it leads to an established sidewalk system. If in fact we were to put the sidewalk on Poe Road, we could tie a crosswalk in from Poe Road uh, to the opposite side of the roadway where the bus currently exists. If the sidewalk is once on one side of the road, we could put one crosswalk across it 
which will probably be on the um, south southeast corner, I believe, if I'm correct, uh, or the south side if you're if you're looking at Princeton Kingston Road running north south. Um, if side works were to go on on both sides, we could put um, a double crosswalk there, uh, which would lead to identifying the intersection as a cross street. And statistics will show that those types of in uh, roadway markings tend to lower the speed limit. So once again, I do respect um, and believe that Mr. Miller's uh, concerns are valid and legitimate. However, um, once again, if you look at the common good and we do eventually uh, employ the sidewalks there, that would enable us to perhaps employ those crosswalk markings and it may in the interim help reduce the speeds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Simon? Yeah, I had um, actually a couple of questions. The first is, um, uh, Director toward Mr. Kaiser, and I'm going to apologize, I'm going to be a little bit pointed. I felt a bit blindsided by the um, residents' reaction as they started providing emails um, because I had formed an opinion of what I expected them to communicate to us based on the uh, report you gave to us when, the, uh, when this um, ordinance was introduced, where you characterized their sentiments as ranging from being in favor of the sidewalks to having no objection to being opposed. But at this point, all of them are opposed. And I actually, I, I have no idea who changed sides or whatever, but could you, I guess, communicate to us a little bit more about what happened in the meeting on, October, on August 4th and who was there um, was it only you from the town and who was there from the, the residents and kind of how that went? Sure. Um, uh, some residents were at the meeting, as I recall. There were perhaps three or four uh, residents uh, there, and we had uh, a varied response uh, at the time. Uh, uh, we discussed uh, uh, the improvement of the road, uh, the extension of the curbing and so forth, uh, there were some concerns regarding the road width. There were some concerns regarding parking as to whether there'd be any change in, in parking. Uh, Dr. DiMartino, of course, was there and uh, was very opposed to the sidewalks for two reasons. Number one, uh, the cost, and then secondly, uh, the need to uh, maintain them. Um, I believe there was another member of council there as well. Um, I, I don't recall uh, who. I know I was out of town, so I okay. couldn't have been there. Okay, well, I apologize. But at 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 that that time, the reading that I had was uh, Dr. Di Martino was, of course, uh, very opposed, and others uh, uh, hadn't indicated that they uh, had objected, but there were questions. Okay. I, I, also, it's like I, go, I don't remember the vote, but I think sometimes we don't ask for a vote either. I think it's just presented, sure. and then there's feedback that's gotten. Um, I'm sorry, the, the public hearing is over but i think if it was a regular neighborhood meeting they always have the same format and we always have questions and it's more of an informational session so maybe we're talking about different meetings i'm not sure what the meeting would be well did you have more to your yes. question yes i did uh, and this is actually um uh, directed toward uh, either mr so or possibly to uh councilman Kremler or Councilor, uh, council president miller as members of the planning board, um, one of the concerns the residents have raised is the cost. And that leads to the concern about whether we're pitting two policies that we hold dear against each other, the, the um, complete streets uh, as well as the, the walkability of Princeton versus the making Princeton affordable. Has the planning board done any work to sort of assess to, to what extent we are on average. I, I understand that there are certainly costs impact, I, impacting um, these particular folks on, for this project, but on average in terms of the policy, whether we are 
it, whether the complete streets program and the um, uh, the, the proposed sidewalk uh, routing in the master plan, uh, do we do we have an understanding of its impact on the affordability uh, for Princeton residents overall? Has that been assessed at all? And I'm not sure. No, the direct, no. The planning board has not assessed that or considered that. And I, I'll add to that and maybe ask uh, Mr. Kaiser for some help on this. I seem to recall that when I first came on Township Committee, the cost of sidewalks was born 75%, 25%. 75% uh, by the homeowner, 25% by the municipality. Am I, is my recollection correct? Yes, that is, that is correct. And then the former Township Committee changed the policy to 50%, 50%. And that was probably about 10 years ago. Some, oh, Or less, yes. Yeah, roughly 10 years ago. So in, in answer to the question you raised, it has changed over time. Not The impetus to change was not from the planning board. The impetus to change was from the Township Committee. You know, and we also, or, um, so right after consolidation, we discussed um, having the town take over the cost of si sidewalks. Um, I think we should revisit that again. I think it would go along, uh, you know, I, th I think we should consider, consider how much it would cost and consider how it might make it a lot easier to get our sidewalk plan completed. I, I'd certainly be in favor of looking at that. And it was, I think it makes sense for the Public Works Committee to be the group that um, does that analysis. And I would say that if this ordinance were to pass tonight and there, were, there was going to be a change in policy, that it would take effect before anybody in this neighborhood would be charged. So if we decide that the town would take on either a greater percentage of it or even in the entirety that um, whatever that decision would be would affect this neighborhood. Well, that, um, yeah, we have discussed that in the past and that wasn't actually my question. My question that was is in terms of the two principles that we've got, if, we've, if anybody has critically looked at whether we are defeating the diversity question and the, and the affordability question um, by building up the infrastructure this way. And it, it does seem like we need that study. And that's independent of exactly how the, court, the costs are, are allocated. Well, I, it also, I mean, that's, it also, we might want to get the tax assessor involved. Is that what you're saying? Because do sidewalks improve the value of a, a house? You know, is that what you're saying? No, no, the presumption is they do. I mean, that's, the, that's part of the legal justification for the assessment. That, that's not the question. The, the, the question is, is whether the build out of infrastructure is having a negative impact on the affordability of Princeton for its residents over time. And well, probably, uh, well, there'd be all sorts of, uh, it would be a very complicated are. analysis to look at all of it. But I do think that Deanna can probably speak. Do, do you have the hazardous bus routes, uh, some of those numbers? I mean, that, that is a very expensive um, proposition. It's a lot. And so to the extent that we can reduce the number of um, people that we have to bus because of hazardous routes, that saves us, you know, that can be offset against the cost of the sidewalk. Right. Over the whole community, we pay about $180,000 a year for hazardous busing. Um, it depends on how many students are on each bus as the per pupil cost. Um, and, and I think the state law also gives you a cutoff amount that you can't charge over a certain amount. I think in this area it's probably about $5,000. I can double check that number, but I think that's in the range of what we would pay for those students per year. Okay. Ms. Butler? Uh, yes, I do want to thank the neighbors um, for coming out this evening. And um, I appreciate your concerns. Um, I, I am going to support, I think, the sidewalks uh, in part because I think that when we talk about the cost-benefit analysis, as, as Mr. Glickman did, 
I, I go back to what um, Mr. Bunting said about the safety of one child. Neighborhoods do change over time, and we really have to look at a 20-year timeline when we're thinking about neighborhoods. Um, I know that even GPSs have changed the traffic patterns in certain neighborhoods, and, and they now get more traffic than they used to. They, they're pushed onto these streets. And I think that when we're thinking about 20 years and what might happen on Poe Road, you may not think people travel it much now, but there may be more development. And um, as Sergeant Murray said, we it is a piece of a puzzle. If I thought that we weren't going to look at the uh, sidewalk on um, Route 27 for 10 or 15 years, then getting this piece of puzzle wouldn't make any difference. You know, it would be more uh, questionable. But I think if we have a legitimate shot, and you're telling me that we might, to get some sidewalk along Route 27 in the foreseeable future, the next five years, five to seven years, then I think that this makes sense to try and connect them. Maybe children won't walk along Route 27, but I see a lot of people on foot, on bike, on Route 27 now, and whether it's a bus sign or a bus stop, uh, Councilman Miller, I think people do use it. I see people at those stops. And so um, I, I think it's an important network that we want to complete over time. It's a goal. It's been in the master plan. It's not a surprise. Um, we, The borough adopted complete streets. The township adopted complete streets. We readopted it as a consolidated community. The county has done it. The state has done it. We really are um, trying to make this a more walkable and safer community. So for those reasons, I, I am going to support it. Yeah, Mr. Simon? Yeah, I was done with my questions, but I should have also explained myself as well. Um, I, I will also support the, the sidewalk project. Um, the uh, and and for many of the reasons that already mentioned, the uh, the fact is that uh, now is the most cost-effective time to do so, and the public benefits of the sidewalks, including the fully connected network envisioned in the uh, in the town's master plan, is uh, is significant. Um, it hasn't been an easy decision. I. I um, I do understand the burden uh, placed on the on the neighbors in in this area. Um, and, and I don't wish to downplay that. Um, the, having seen a few of these uh, types of votes um, uh, in the past, the vast majority of residents with sidewalks have found a way to handle the cost and care required. And unfortunately, delaying the project would actually increase the cost, both to the town and to the, um, the residents of this neighborhood. Um, and it would also delay the public benefit. So for these reasons, I do intend to vote in favor of this uh, ordinance. Okay. Um, well, I, I think we're going to call the vote in just a second. Um, I, I would like to say I'm probably not going to vote on this one because it doesn't look like there's going to be a tie, especially since there's only five people here. Um, but that um, I do want to thank all the neighbors for coming out, and I think everybody up here hears you and does not want this to be something that feels... Um, you know, anybody feels so burdened that they're overwhelmed by this. And so the municipality does want to work with you. Public Works will take a look at our policy of how we do the assessments for sidewalks now that we're a consolidated municipality. I think it's something that makes sense for us to at least take a look at um, and to work with you if you have problems with shoveling. Once a sidewalk is in, we're here. It's really a safety issue. We want to help you. We want to make this work. Um, but with that, um, I'm going to ask uh, Madam Clerk to please call the roll. Oh, actually, we need a motion first. Yes. So I'm going to move it. So moved. Second. It's moved by Mr. Liverman and seconded by Ms. Crumiller. And Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Crumiller? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. No. Mr. Liverman? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Butler? Yes. Mr. Simon? Yes. Motion carries. The motion carries uh, four to one with um, Mr. Miller voting no. Um, thank you very much. And then you guys are here for the rec board ordinance. And is there anybody here for any of the other items on the agenda? Uh, you're here for the resolution for the Washington Road Crossing? OK. Um, so if that's okay, just to bump those up. And you guys are welcome to stay even after we get to your item, but I know it's getting late. So um, let's do the next 
public hearing, which is um, an ordinance by Princeton concerning recreation and parks and similar public places and amending the code of the borough of Princeton, New Jersey, 1974, and the code of the township of Princeton, New Jersey, 1968. And if there's no um, questions or comments right now from council, I'll just go ahead and directly open the public hearing. Okay, um, public hearing's open. Um, Pam Mackle, 713 Prospect Avenue. Um, yeah. Okay. In 2008, we have this wonderful book that was put out. It was called The Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Um, something happened. I don't know what it was. I was on the uh, um, Environmental Commission. It was like parks just vanished. We had the rec department doing really well, getting lobbied every day by, for soccer fields, baseball, etc. And it was like parks just sort of disappeared. Well, those of us that are involved in parks and managing open space were a little bit concerned. So in 2009, I think, I wrote, no, I guess it was just before the merger, I wrote a letter about proposing a parks commission. It would be free. I mean, this was a volunteer thing. Nobody would have to pay. But, and Liz was, uh, our mayor was terrific, and she said, we'll put it on our priorities list, and it was, and we did convene this group. But there was resistance, and I can understand they were afraid that it would be a new bureaucracy. We'd have a new commission for parks. Um, that's not exactly the way we set it up, but that was the feeling we had at the meeting, and so, I disbanded the group that Liz had appointed, and I was to convene, and I said, okay, uh, there's resistance here, and what it was, was public works and recreation departments said they could put out a report and handle parks and open space. It's a hard word, because when you say parks, you think of active or passive. Okay, um, the report never came, at least not, never to me, and uh, we disbanded our group. In February, I saw Town Topics, and it said the parks had been taken over by the Recreation Department. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, what happened was the Recreation Department was doing the mowing, the maintenance, but the big issues of trees, trails, all the things that go into passive recreation, there was no point person. I still didn't know who to go to. I mean, there was Greg O'Neill, who was the township ar arborist and open space manager, but he does sh uh, street trees. We have 19,000 street trees. I think he's a little overworked here. So we just flowed with the flow, and sure enough, I run Marquan Park, which is an arboretum now, and the rec did a great job mowing it. However, we found that all the mowing in the past had damaged a lot of our valuable trees, so we had to go back and redo that. We had to remulch them. We had to repair them. All this is to say that there was still no real point person for us to talk to. Um, I'm also trying to preserve the Textile Research Institute land, which is about 17 acres. It's fantastic habitat and environmental uh, addition. But I didn't know who to go to for that. And so <laughs> my point is that now I hear there's a report. It's online. I couldn't access it, unfortunately, today. Um, I'll try to get a copy of it that our mayor and other people have put together for a new parks uh, management, and that's great. And I'll read the report, and I, God bless you for doing it. I, we've got to have something, because nobody knows where to go. So we did talk about that at the beginning of the meeting under reports. Um, and it'll be something, it was just a proposal tonight, but there seemed to be consensus among council that people are interested in doing some sort of open space maintenance advisory group 
and then we'll have something on a future agenda that would be a resolution that would establish it. That's excellent. But I can't say I'm totally for this ordinance right now. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to thank everybody concerned for paying attention to the open space issues that were brought up. I think uh, the idea of, of having this task force or however it works out to be is a wonderful one. Uh, I, I still, I reread the ordinance and not being an attorney, I don't really understand, does open space come under the Recreation Commission or is it a separate issue? Because the two funding streams are very separate. So that's a question I have, that we have, a, we have the, we have two separate funding streams and it's not really clear where open space falls in all of this, except that the council administrates the open space funding. And I think that it, that's something that would be very helpful to have clarified uh, in the ordinance so uh, we have a clear path of uh, managing open space. Because as we all know, the following the money is very important in, in trying to manage everything. But I, and I do appreciate Mr. Uh, Brusheye's concern about establishing open space as more of a priority than it has been. So, it, it is, can anybody answer the question of whether the, the funding can come space? from a variety of sources? It's not actually necessary to call that out. Most of our ordinances don't call out where the funding comes from. The council has options with regard to that, whether it be the general operating budget, which does provide some maintenance money for um, recreation. It could come out of a portion of the open space money. When this committee meets or this task force meets and brings its report to the governing body, the purpose of bringing that report is to say we need X dollars in which to implement what our recommendations are. Mm -hmm. Then between staff, uh, meaning our finance uh, people, the administration, we'll come up with a recommendation to the governing body as to how that might be accommodated within the next uh, budget uh, cycle. Mm -hmm. So then the governing body would adopt um, a budget presumably of some amount, and then they would have to indicate where the funding is going to come uh, from to support that budget. I think you're asking the opposite, though, which is what the rec board had control over in terms of Right, their budget. but this and, is very helpful to right, know so also. That's, but, that's for the open space, but for the, the, rec, the open space money that's collected through the initiative, right, right. That is under council's control. That's not under the the rec board. Does have some money that it controls, but it's not the open space fund. So basically, open space doesn't really fall under the rec board. The trails and the bridges. Is it, it depends. I mean, I think the way this might be structured would be, um, for example, this maintenance group meets. Right. They recommend that major trail work needs to be done in X Park. Then that recommendation is made to council. We put it in the budget and wherever the money comes from, it would be the recreation department that would be the one overseeing that work, either directly through its own staff or by the ones, the, the staff members who are getting some, you know, sending out the contract and, and getting somebody from the outside to do the work. So they would be the ones who are managing it, either from internal staffing or from contracting out. Right. That was the, that's at least the, the plan, how it's written now. Right. So the only other point I'd like to make is that I hope in this whole situation there will be attention paid to environmental resource management because there's a lot, I mean, aside from trail maintenance and cutting things down, there are water quality, there are all kinds of issues that I think have, uh, with the, all of the things going on with consolidation and other things have kind of gotten under the radar screen, I think, and uh, a lot of people are are concerned about those uses. They want to walk the trails and ride their bicycles and enjoy the open space. So thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. 
Um, are there any other comments? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Are there any um, comments or questions on this ordinance? Ms. Butler? I was, Ben Stentz is here. He wasn't here when we introduced the ordinance, I think, two weeks ago. Do you want to address some of the issues that were raised about how work gets done on the in any of the parks under whether it's um, the rec portion the uh, pocket park kind of passive recreation or the open space sure um, I'm Ben Stentz the uh, executive director of recreation department um, so there's a few a few ways that it happens to just go back a couple years prior to consolidation there were three municipal entities covering this big pie of parks recreation open space maintenance it was the recreation department the borough public works department and the township public works department we consolidated and obviously one of those three two of those three became one so then there were two entities and at the beginning of this year 2014 uh, planning well, planning, let me go back a half year further. Planning began halfway through 2013 for a transition that would have the Recreation Department taking over a big chunk of the park maintenance work in the former borough parks. That was initially being done by the Borough Public Works and then by the Joint Public Works once we consolidated. Um, that plan was put into motion roughly d uh, January 1 of this past year. We did it all this year. Um, not 100% on our own. We outsourced some of that work, primarily the mowing. We still worked in concert with Bob Huff and his crew um, as needed. And so when it comes to any and all work at the active parks, the passive parks, any of these properties, um, we have said out loud, I have said out loud many, many times, um, call me. And I'll do one of a few things. We'll either solve it with our recreation maintenance staff, We'll partner with the public works staff, which we do all the time, Bob and Greg O'Neill, who's the open space manager, um, or we will consider outsourcing that work, a la the big chunk of mowing that we outsourced this year. So those are kind of the three ways that something can get done. The fourth piece, which, which Patrick mentioned early in this meeting, it seemed like days ago, was the volunteer efforts that Pam and her colleagues uh, with the Friends of Marquand have done, which, which actually is a remarkable amount, amount of work over the years, as well as the Friends of Princeton Open Space, the Petronello Garden crew. I mean, the work that these groups are doing is invaluable, and I hope that, as Patrick said earlier, when we get this task force slash committee uh, moving forward, that we can use that as a platform to to encourage more people to come forward and either participate in existing groups or, or form other groups. Um, like Joe, you and I have talked about many times about the Harrison Street Park, where there seems to be a desire for more to happen and the kind of this buzz about getting a friends group together. They haven't quite done it yet, but maybe it's coming. And, and so this committee could be a platform to encourage more of that, which we need because I want to be really clear, and I've said this to probably all of you up there, certainly to Bob and Kathy, there's no committee that you can form, there's no meeting you can have, there's no public comment you can have that will solve any of this without the resources to get the work done. And that is some combination of bodies and or dollars um, to get stuff done that, whether it's something I want to get done, Pam, council anybody the resources are going to have to follow this or we will be back having the same conversation in a year because we have had it before um, that's the reality I've been on the record of saying that right now I believe our maintenance staff is two people short to deal with the existing workload we have since we took over so much of the former borough parks as well as garbage pickup and other responsibilities in some of the passive areas so in my position that's two people short just to get us to even on what we're doing now so when we start to consider an additional layer of things that certainly probably do need to be done Pam and I have discussed a lot of things that uh, that need to get done relatively soon that's just more resources and I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page whatever that recommendation may be from the committee that we're going to come back and say here's the, here's the three priorities that the task force of the committee has come up with and here's what we think it's going to cost resource-wise to do these things, and that's ultimately where the rubber hits the road on whether stuff's going to get done or not. Um, 
because we, we have almost doubled our, the number of locations we're maintaining this year without increasing our, our FTEs. And, and we've done that through trying to find efficiencies and, and push people a little bit harder and, and be a little bit smarter with our time and our resources. But that, there is an end point to that, to that philosophy, and we're, we're pretty close to it. Can you also address sort of the running list you keep of the things that need to be done in the various parks, but also, um, you know, a little bit how you work with Greg and which things you do right away versus things you have to do seasonally, sure. how you keep lists, how you inventory the parks? Yeah, so historically we, we do park inspections on what were the, probably you would consider the active parks for many years, and we do those regularly, and we have dueling lists going on. There's things that have to happen almost every day at some parks. There's things that have to happen maybe once a week, once a month, once a year. And so we're constantly juggling those different types of lists. As we've taken on new facilities, whether it be the pocket parks in the former borough or other areas, that has uh, led us to a tighter communication system with Bob and with Greg because there are jobs that come to us either by phone or email or now access Princeton that as we currently are structured are things that Greg needs to take care of, either because he has the equipment to take care of them, he has the expertise to take care of them, or they just fit better in the type of work that Greg and his crews are doing on a daily basis compared to what my crew is doing. So um, a year ago when we had the committee that the mayor started, we brainstormed the idea of that email, parks at PrincetonNJ.gov. We uh, promoted it as best we could. We got emails from residents about things. We tried to either solve those issues or funnel them to Greg or figure out how to deal with them as best we could. Now that Access Princeton's up, we're hoping that that will be the, the, uh, the vehicle that people will use to get stuff to us. And of course, a lot of different things have come in through there, including a lot of the things that Pam's group, along with Bob Wells, came up with, with the uh, really extensive report that Bob put together about the condition of some of the trees and uh, branches and root issues, and, and those have all been entered in Access Princeton and directed to Greg, and now we come back to the same thing. It's a resource issue. Greg's aware of every single one of those things. Um, Greg could go do them all right now and not do other things that he's determined are more high priority, or Greg could set his priority and we trust that he can do that right and then we come back to how come things aren't happening quick enough and that is often where we come back to okay thanks ben sure um i think we're gonna have to make some decisions about the the rest of this meeting too but i think at this point is there a motion yeah Mr. Uh, actually Simon? i'm sorry i have um i guess a concern this um ordinance assigns the the um control of open space, the Parks and Recreation Commission. And if we're, um, if we're considering what Mr. Breshai proposed earlier, it seems like we're about to contradict that um, in the very short term. It's, the, the task force would be advisory. And so it's, I, I don't see that as. It would almost be like a subcommittee of the rec, uh, of this commission really of parks and rec it would be well would yeah be i mean it advisory. could be by statute the commission has that authority i mean that's what's guiding this whole discussion what we're trying to do is come up with a another committee that can give input you know to you and then you will give input to the commission now i guess in in a wild and crazy world they could just get their back up in the air and say well you know what we're not doing that we don't care if you're funding it or whatever we're just not going to do it i just don't see that as as an issue it never has been it's going to be handled by staff it's not going to be handled by the volunteer recreation commission members so i just don't see that as any any real concern i think part of the issue is that you know we have so much going on now that if you know you have the rec board and it's hard for them, I think it's going to be hard for them as the rec board to have the conversation that needs to be had every year about maintenance priorities for open space. And so this is really the idea for this advisory group is really to help take the load off that main rec board committee. Because I'm sure the rec board meetings every month have a full agenda of regular rec stuff. And so, and this, maintenance meeting is going to be you know you need to look at all the parks it's going to take a while and so it just helps to 
smooth out so that we can be doing our due diligence on all the issues we need to be doing our due diligence on. And when, uh, when Bob and I went over this earlier today, one thing he suggested was that however this committee is made up, that a, rec, a, a current rec commission representative be one of the people at that table of this committee so that there's some continuity and some connection between the two groups so that you know nobody's surprised what, what anybody else is working on. Yeah, exactly. Um, which I think probably is a really good idea to... Well, right. Just to clarify, I, the statute requires that language. That's that's why it's in there. Well, that's fine. It yeah. does feel like we're creating a little bit of a roundabout process, but um, but if all the people involved think it's going to work, I have no objections. I, mission, I make a motion that we accept the ordinance. I'll second. Um, ordinance is moved by Mr. Leverman and seconded by Ms. Crummiller. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Crummiller? Yes. Mr. Miller? Mr. Liverman? Yes. Ms. Butler? Yes. Mr. Simon? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you. Um, okay. Um, I propose we go just because um, I know Sam and Dan are here for the um, resolution on the um, crossing on Washington Road, and then I think we need to decide if we're going to try to do the parking technology tonight and how long people are willing to stay here for. So um, my sense is that unless you're dying to say something that there's support for this resolution. Um, so is, is there a motion? I'll move it. Second. Yeah. Okay, so this is a motion by Ms. Cremola to move 14-311 resolution to request Mercer County to install safety improvements at the DNR Canal Towpath on Washington Road. Seconded by Mr. Liverman. All in favor? Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Seconded by Mr. Miller. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the resolution passes. Um, all right. Does, is, since Deanne has been waiting here, and she has a, I mean, do people want to, do people have the energy to go over the, the different options for the parking garage? I know that Mr. Simon, Ms. Crummeller, and myself have heard a version of this a couple times before. So for the three of us, I think it's um, going to be less of a mental exercise. But I want to just see, um, Ms. Butler, Mr. Lipman, are you all able to I mean I think it would help Stay the Dalai Lama shows up. No, <laughs> no we're gonna we're gonna leave before the Dalai Lama arrives. How about the protesters? The protesters are probably setting up camp already, so I can't um, but seriously do people are people up for hearing I think it's some it'd be useful to yep. give Deanna some uh, feedback. Yeah if, we, if she can okay speak quickly. No. I, I think it's good no I think it's good to get this out just <laughs> No, yeah, can you keep off up there? Well, well, let me if just you have a chance to think about it. I mean, I read it, but I'd like to hear what Deanna has to say, too. Yeah, and, and while you're getting set up, um, I can just give the report from the um, Princeton Merchants Association meeting that I attended along with Deanna and Bob Brushai. And the reaction there were the, the merchants really wanted something that was going to be simple and easy to use. And I think there was a desire not to rock the boat too much. So their preference seemed to be some variant of the system we have now. I think because they were making the assumption that that would be the simplest. Did you take a vote? <laughs> we did, actually. Oh. We did. Oh. So I would say at least two-thirds of the room was in favor of some variant of what we have today. And then the rest were on the fence. And I don't think anybody was voting for option A, but I can't remember. For option one? For, for the, having like the metered spots. Oh, right. So you all have a, the work session uh, memo that we provided. Uh, Bob Huff and I put that together. Um, and I've also put together a short PowerPoint for you as well. Um, you have an overall map of what we have for parking in town. Um, become disconnected, I'm not sure. Um, so. oh. Is that? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's the operator error. <laughs> 10.40 p.m. Uh, 
we have approximately 1,100 meters in town as well as uh, the 500 spaces in the parking garage and uh, we also have seven surface lots as part of that 1,100 meters. Uh, we've provided you with some statistics in the memo and I've uh, shortened those in this slide. We, we have the garage manned 122 hours per week, typically from about 6.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. I think on the weekends uh, somebody is there as well until about 2 p.m. 2 a.m., sorry. Uh, and our staff. <laughs> Maybe if we reduce the, uh, the uh, hours of work at, in the uh, central business district, no, we could lower that. Uh, anyway, so what we had presented in the memo and to the Pr Princeton Merchants Association are variations of parking infrastructure. The first slide shows what we have currently. This is the post-pay infrastructure where you have, you have to take a ticket in order to enter the garage or insert a credit card or smart card. Uh, you can stay as long as you want. There is no uh, penalty for staying longer except you pay the fee as you exit. Um, there is sufficient provisions to allow validations with the Princeton Library. The current technology even allows that to be rolled out further with uh, merchants in town, that merchants in town would also be able to provide validations as some sort of incentive to bring people into their businesses and um, spend money. The second option that we've pre presented is the prepay meters. This is what we have installed over at the Princeton Station lot recently also rolled it out on Alexander Street. You pay before you leave the parking area. You determine the amount of time that you want to stay. Uh, you deposit your money into the meter. And um, in our case, we do it as a, as a pay by space. So you pay for your, intent, your parking space. There are ways to extend your parking time under this type of system. Uh, we have not instituted it yet, it's, but it is part of the software that if you pay by a credit card, you can extend your time. Uh, because we have the no meter feeding rules in place in our ordinances, we did not enact that. Um, and in the downtown area, because we do want some turnover for parking, uh, we would look, have to look closely at that option, whether or not we want to implement that. It's more difficult, though, for validations. Uh, currently, we have the two hours free parking uh, for the library. It's very difficult to do that for your current stay. Um, you could issue a coupon for future visits that could then use that um, two hours free. Or there's a way that you can send emails with a one-time use coupon. So if you wanted to roll this system out, uh, perhaps say the library would send out an email to all of their card holders saying, come visit the library. If you want to stay at the parking garage, here's a, here's a two-hour validation. And then from that point forward, they would be able to get coupons for their future stays. Uh, it also is less friendly for refunds. Uh, as you know, in our single head meters, if you use your smart cards, you can pay for, say, your two hours of stay. And if you want to leave after an hour, you can put your smart card back in for a refund. That's not the case with this type of meter. This type of meter, you can get a refund, but it's printed on um, a piece of paper that you then have to take to a destination. In our case, you would go to the garage parking um, office, most likely. Uh, but the refund is also for, say, you put in a $5 bill to pay for two hours of parking, which costs you $2. Then you get a $3 refund. You do not get a refund if you decide to only stay for an hour, uh, just to make that clear. So um, can, I, can I ask a quick question, Deanna? So right now in the garage, you can park 30 minutes for free. Right. How would that work with the meter? That would be incorporated into the rate structure. 
uh, in the software. It's a very flexible system, so we could set it up for you know a two-hour time period, a four-hour time period, whatever it is we we think yeah. as we've seen. Yeah. You, you know, can the, program it any way you want to. Right. Like, let's say I drive in and I want to be there for 20 minutes, so I put in that I'm going to be there for 20 minutes, and it doesn't charge me. You would probably put in that you're going to be there for the 30, and then maybe that's one thing we set up, is that then you wouldn't be charged for those 30 seconds. The 30 minutes. The 30 minutes. minutes. 30 it would show that you're in the space, but that there's no fee for the 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, the way it's really supposed to be structured is it's up to 30 minutes mm -hmm. free. That means you come in, you do your business, and you're out of the garage within that 30 minutes. Otherwise, if you trip over the 30, you go to 31, you're paying for right. the 31. No, I understand that. Clear, okay. Yeah, it's just like I, I haven't been to a meter where you can basically put in air, and it's going to be, I mean, it's going to let you be there for <laughs> 29 minutes. Right, so the last option uh, that we presented is the man booth concept, where you have somebody there 24 7, uh, similar to the way the Whole Fish and the Chambers garages are currently operated in town. Uh, that there would be somebody that you pay. It's a it's post pay environment as well. So you come in, you get a ticket, go through the gates. But upon exiting, you would interface with a person and pay for your stay at that point. Um, so those were the three options. The fourth option that is not mentioned anywhere in here um, is possibly working with a management company. Um, you know, whether you team with somebody locally, with whoever's working um, on the Palmer Square garages, or if it's something that goes more um, regional. That is another fourth option that's not looked at. Our current situation, though, with the garage is we've got antiquated equipment that does not work, um, that's not being not, supported. Right, by not vendor. being supported, not being um, maintained by the, the vendor that we had. So we need to make some significant changes to the garage. We do have money that's been budgeted um, by, it's in the 2015 capital budget. Um, somewhere between 150 to 275 thousand dollars would be available in the budget. Um, I have this slide that does show the budget considerations that is also in your handout. We have the initial capital investment as well as then the uh, yearly operational costs involved with each of them. Prepay is definitely a cheaper version. Uh, it has limited capabilities, and it does not give the safe haven that we currently have in the garage. Um, but you have the cost with the postpay. Hopefully, it will um, not have, will not require the staff hours that we have now, because it will be uh, a current technology that is supported by the vendor and and. Um, and that, really, and that really should be a goal, too, because we are overstaffed in that garage because our, of equipment failures where we have to hand walk people through or actually literally manually open the gate, issue refunds. It's, it really is a mess. Even though they're all part-time hourly employees, we have to have many times numerous numbers of them down there depending on what's going on and how busy uh, we are. So that, I believe, now we're going to save hundreds of thousands of dollars no but you're going to save tens and tens and tens now all money that can ultimately revert back to the operating budget thank you for um that presentation yes, i think it was really clear and, and answered i think all the questions that we had and i just want to say i know Ms. butler has a question but the goal for tonight is to really decide and give some direction among these three choices if we can reach some consensus that would be the goal so ms butler um bob do you, i feel like since the opening of the garage i know you say the equipment's no longer supported by the vendor and probably our personnel costs have increased but it seemed to me from the very beginning for, for that system we had an awful lot of 
people around that I, I, you know, given the fact that we were moving from that surface lot, I thought one of the benefits of the parking garage was that it would have this system, but it never, we always seem to have as many people as we'd had when we had the old surface lot. Do you have any sense of what our overall personnel costs have been over the 10 years that the garage has I, been I don't open? have the numbers in front, Joe, but you're, what you're, referring to is entirely correct. That garage was designed theoretically to be no need for any staffing for the garage. Now, remember that the people that are working at our office are the, are the parking people that go out and do the meter collections and the meter fixing. Everything is right out of the garage, so it always looks like there's a ton of people hanging around. They're not all working at the garage, but that's where their office is. That's where their computers are. That's where they work out of. They used to work out of the Suzanne Patterson Center before we had the garage. So it always looks like there's, you know, 20 garage people down there when that's not the case. But that equipment has never, to my knowledge, I'll bet there, there can't be 20 days in the history of that garage that every piece of that equipment has worked. It has been a nightmare for a lack of a better word since the beginning and it's been a constant fight between the two vendors whether it's the software vendor or the equipment vendor they don't like each other i don't know what the deal is but we really need to go revisit that technology take a leap forward too with things like deanna is, is presenting here which are going to carry us forward with pay by phone and all those other things that you can potentially do down the down the line so well, I guess part of the question then is what is the confidence we can get another system that works? Get any system that will work. Um, the ones that we're, you know, that we're experiencing, I mean, we have to, we, we bid that system out as part of the garage project. I mean, that was something that was being recommended by PAL. In fact, we didn't bid it out. It was part of that project. It should have been bid out. Maybe we would have got a better uh, vendor. But that was part of our package. You know, we definitely approved it, no doubt about that. We said, yes, that looks exactly what we want, et cetera. Um, but I think you know, with 10 years of history, we do a lot more checking uh, into those manufacturers to find out what we're getting. Um, you know, we've had meetings with uh, vendors to talk about options. Um, you know, that's where Deanna is getting a lot of her information. And I would suggest we do our due diligence a lot more than we did when we built that garage. We were kind of flying a little blind um, with that one. So, um, but my recommendation, if you're looking for anything tonight, is that we do go to the prepay or um, postpay system of some type, um, so that we don't have to worry about issuing tickets in the garage. People don't have to worry about that. They can come in, park, you know, have a system that they have confidence in, that's simple to operate, and. Um, I think that'll meet the merchant's concerns and it'll meet ours, and I do believe we'll end up saving some significant staffing time with um, all the hourly people we hire. Done. So, Ms. Cromwell? Um, so, do, so um, Mr. DeShield, do you have any parking garages in Montclair, and how do they work? <laughs> we actually do. Push the button. Uh, we actually do have parking garages. Um, we actually go with her fourth option, which is we have them uh, pri privately managed by an outside firm. And did you look at other garages that have the prepay system? Or I've spoken with other municipalities that have used it. I have not gone out and visited yet. That would be the next step but of they, the due diligence. I mean, and have they reported positive results with it? They have, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I really like, that's a lot of money we could save with the prepay system. And I also, I like the freedom of it, of not having the gate. I mean, I don't know, the safe haven and the merchants want this gate thing, but to me, I want to get out of the garage. Yeah, and I, I should just report, we, we've had this discussion a few times around in public works, and I think Jenny and I are um, more inclined towards the prepay, and I think Mr. Simon tends to be more inclined towards the postpay, and, you know, we, I think there's a concern if you go to the prepay what people's expectations are when they enter into a garage. Um, but one of the advantages of the prepay that... Um, we haven't talked about yet is it gives you the ability to encourage people to park at the higher deck level so you could charge a different rate for people who park on the top deck and that you can't do that with the, the post pay 
it, it seems to me that there's a private garage a few yards from our public garage that uses a post pay system with attendance and <clears throat> if you drive into New York there are many many garages and I've yet to see a garage with any kind of meter in the garage it's always a post pay garage you go in and you pay on the way out um, it, it, it's not clear to me why technology is a great advantage here I can answer I mean uh, just I, mean, I, I would have to say like I'm not I could go probably go either way um, but one advantage is that it's if you have a problem with the machine it's your own problem with the machine and you're not aggravating the 20 people waiting in line behind you because you're having a problem with your ticket or getting out of the gate um, and it just seems to be you know out west a lot of the municipal garages use the prepay so if that's an indication of where things are going and this is a technology we're going to have for 10 years it might be that the standard right now is the post pay but in five years pretty much everybody who's built a garage is doing the prepay and we're going to feel antiquated i mean it's, it's hard to tell but i think i think there's prepays in a, in a lot of places i just up at rutgers they use it i've seen it at even in New Jersey in some places. I mean, in some ways it's easier because everybody knows how to work a parking meter. And it's essentially saying work a parking meter. And it, it seems like the garages are what trip people up and getting a ticket and putting it in in the right direction and knowing whether you're supposed to pay before you get in your car or whether you can pay at the gate. There's just... Ms. Butler? It seems unfortunate, though, this meter... The only meters we can get, you, you can't get your money back if you overpay or I mean without this elaborate voucher system that ugh, no, nobody's gonna do that right I mean for a dollar or whatever but it, it is annoying not you know that would be a disincentive to use it for some people if every time you used it you're yeah. leaving money on the table well the alternate is if you do allow the extend by phone then you can start with a small amount and then if you decide to stay longer then you can extend or if the system gets rolled out through town and you have more of the pay stations in town you can go to any of the pay stations and extend your stay uh, if we allow the software to have that capability right, but we're really never I mean it's hard to imagine a scenario under which we would want we want turnover in the central business district and we want people to go into the garage for longer periods of time so I mean I can't imagine how we would ever have a system on the street that we'd allow people to feed the meters essentially Correct, or stay right. for longer than two hours for the streets I, I don't think that is uh, a feature that you would want to implement right but for say the Princeton station lot where you have people going in to New York and it's a 14 hour time limit that could potentially make sense to have an extended stay if you know somebody's worked all day and they decide oh I'm gonna stay and have dinner instead of taking the train back then they might have that option to extend um, and maybe the garage is the same thing because you do want people to stay there longer rather than tying up the street uh, meters and feeding the meters it, yeah it's just all on how you program the system and code the lots uh, code the parking spaces so could you have a, a pay meter out on Nassau Street that would talk to your space in the garage and you could extend your space in the garage through that meter and you could also pay if you're parking on Nassau Street you could pay there but you wouldn't be allowed to extend your space on Nassau Street so some spaces you would be able to extend others you wouldn't correct it would all be programmed by your space number okay. but and the smartphone is already working the smartphone app so you could extend it from with your smartphone so anyone with a smartphone could extend well the smartphone the payment by smartphone is through an app so if you started your parking session through that app then yes you have the option to extend but if you started your session at a meter the only way to extend is uh, if you'd paid by the credit card then it sends you the text message 
and you can extend there. Otherwise, you would need to go back to a meter. Yeah. I mean, I agree that it is a it is a a big problem that people can't get their money back, like but, like but the smart when, cards. But when do you get it back? I guess if smart you go cards, at, you can. Right. But if you're parking at a meter, if you put in no, with no, with coins. change. No, you're right. I, I know this is.